thank you very much for the invitation of the era. I'm trying to deserve it. Uh, this is not the first time I'm here, but the last time was not yesterday. It was about 20 years ago, uh, when I was a chief negotiator for the accession of Hungary uh, to the European Union, and I had to make a report on the progress of the accession negotiations. But it's interesting uh, to read once again what I said at that time. Anyhow, this is behind us. This is, we are a member, and I spent now almost 14 years at the court, which is a long time in the life of a man. Uh, I must make a normal, formal disclaimer, meaning that, of course, what I say is personal and not, not the views of the court. Although this is not terribly necessary because I am going to mostly give you information about the judgments and the judgment uh, as such, do not need any disclaimer. The title of the presentation is uh, The Latest Jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the EU. And uh, uh, the term latest requires me to, to, to define the period I'm talking about, to, to, to define a cutoff date. And uh, I decided that it should include year 2016 and 17. 16 might not be the latest, but uh, 17 uh, alone is not uh, representative. It turns out that uh, 17, 217 uh, was a very rich year. Uh, we had uh, 31 judgments, while, uh, sorry, in 16 it was 31 judgments, while in 17 it was only 15. Uh, the 15 is not unusual because this is a normal uh, number, it was more or less the same number. Nevertheless, uh, one can wonder why is it decreasing. Uh, we do not have to investigate a lot, uh, but uh, one could say, for example, I'm not sure that this is true, but one could say that the court is exhausting the room of interpretation. We have already said what we had to say, and that's it, and there is no further room for interpretation. This is probably not true, but we hope that there is a grain of reality. So we have already very widely interpreted the directives of the European Union. Perhaps a more important factor that uh, there are new legislation in this field. This is probably well known, but I would mention that in year 2014, there are three new directive, directives, 23, this is about the concessions, 24, this is the public procurement in general, and then 25, this is procurement by entities operating in the field of water, energy, transport, and postal services. So those are the so-called sectoral directives. And it is quite understandable that the national courts thought that perhaps it would be more interesting to pose questions, to send questions under the new directives and not the old directives which are running out of application and 
will cease very soon to be applied. And of course, the new directives need transposition, implementation by the member state and need some application and after some application they can trigger questions by the national courts. Now I'm coming to the cases. Uh, of course, I cannot present all the cases. I selected uh, some of them, um, about a dozen, uh, on the consideration whether they represent additional value in the case law, in the jurisprudence. Although I asked my British colleague whether the term jurisprudence is correct or not, and he says that it is not so correct because this is reserved for university people, this is mostly theoretical, we are uh, recommended to use the word case law. Uh, I admit that I have given preferences to cases in which I was a reporting judge. And in fact, I was reporting judge in many cases in year 2016 in, in 11 cases, in year 2017 in seven cases. Now, uh, in order to present them, I set up categories according to the subject matter. Of course, those categories do not represent all stages of a, a procurement procedure. Some body might find that important stages are missing, the reason that I have not found appropriate case. Now, the categories. I, the first concept of the public contract. The first case is 410-14 Falk Pharma. This is not the most important case, of course. Being first doesn't mean that it's the most important. But it, it, is, it is showing the distinguishing line quite well. In this case, uh, a, a contracting authority established a scheme, a system under which any economic operator, so any uh, company could enter if it undertakes to provide the goods needed under predetermined conditions. And here the court decided that this is not a public contract because a public contract needs element of competition, needs element of selection. If there is no competition among the candidates or, or, or the uh, tenderers and there is no uh, selection among <coughs> them, probably this is not a public contract. Next case is uh, uh, 51 slash 15, Ramondis. It is about the cooperation of uh, authorities. Of course, an authority can be a tenderer, uh, and sometimes the line uh, between a public procurement contract and the cooperation among uh, authorities is quite foggy, hazy, it's not quite obvious, but anyhow, in this case, two authorities uh, uh, established uh, a bond, an association uh, with a legal personality for the purpose of something, on which they transferred a part of that competence to this bond. And uh, this was in the field of waste management. Then the court said that 
This is not a public contract. It does not fall within the meaning of the directives. Third case, this was about the Milan Airport. This is uh, 701 slash 15, Malpensa Logistica, Europa. And here, the airport uh, authority, the airport uh, management, allocated a space to a company for ground handling services, but required no remuneration uh, for it. And the court decided that unless there is a concession, in the concession, of course, the contracting authority does not have to give necessarily a remuneration, but a public contract for services must include always a remuneration. So if, if, if there is no remuneration, it is not falling under the directive of 2004-17, which was the directive applicable at that time. On the other hand, the court emphasized that there is a separate, uh, 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 separate directive, namely Directive 96 uh, slash, uh, 67, which is specifically regulating the ground handling market, and that elements that includes an element of competition. Third, uh, fourth case, it was uh, 567 slash 15, lit spec met. Well, I, it was not, I'm not sure that this is the correct pronunciation, but it doesn't matter. It was about the notion of uh, the concept of body governed by public law. Uh, it was a subsidiary of a public railway company, a subsidiary wholly owned by the railway uh, company. The question was that, is it under the obligation to organize public procurement procedure or not? The court uh, decided that yes, under certain condition it must be considered a body governed by public law if its act activity is necessary for the parent company to be able to meet the needs in the general interest, that is, railway transportation of passengers, and can be decided, can be not decided, guided by non economic considerations. Okay, next subtitle, scope of the application of the directives. Here I should emphasize that there is a new directive beside the, let's say, so-called classical directives or traditional directives, which is in year 2007 which regulates public passenger transport services by rail and by road. So, of course, this is uh, require, requiring some delimitation of this new, this is not a directive, I'm sorry, this is a regulation, regulation directly applicable, and the traditional directives. And this delimitation problem or the distinction problem was raised first in the case Hermann Reisen. Uh, this is 292 slash 15. Uh, because uh, uh, this uh, regulation uh, makes uh, a derogation uh, saying that the transport uh, uh, the passengers, the passenger transport by bus uh, still remains regulated by the classical uh, directives. And uh, the court uh, had to make uh, this di di distinction 
and uh, the court said that uh, this uh, derogation is only in, uh, in only in Article 5. If it's not only 5, Article 5, but a subject in this contract, this was subcontracting, how the subcontracting should be organized, then uh, the lex specialis principle should be applicable, meaning that the lex specialis is the regulation and not the traditional directive. The court uh, had to handle several uh, cases uh, where the amount concerned was under the threshold uh, uh, fixed by the directives. And it seems, I'm not sure, but it seems that the court is beginning to, to take a stricter line, a stricter line, because uh, earlier the court always tried to find a reason to respond to the question put by the national court. But gradually, we are coming to the conclusion that uh, this should be taken seriously. Uh, in fact, uh, if, if it's under the threshold, the contract could remain under the general rules of the treaty and the general principles of the treaty, that are the, the principles of equality, non-discrimination, and the obligation of transparency. Transparency might meaning that some kind of public procurement procedures must be organized on the condition that there is a certain cross-border interest. So there must be a cross-border interest. And the new approach, if it is a new approach, uh, I'm not, not quite sure, in that case, it should be more concrete and it could not be said that since there are elements which in abstract could suggest that there is a cross-border interest is not enough. It, sh it should, should be an evidence which shows very concretely, positively, that there is a, a a cross-border interest. In this case, it was a public work contract. It was an Italian case. And for this public work contract, although the amount was well under the threshold, and uh, many companies from a distance were interested, companies in Italy. And then uh, the national court consider that, of course, in that case, because they are very far away, well, in that distance, perhaps there is other countries could be, uh, could be found. But we emphasize that this is really not enough because a country from an other, uh, uh, for, sorry, a company from an other country must face additional constraints and burdens for example, of course, must adapt to the local legal and administrative uh, circumstances, and uh, this is an additional burden. It could not be said that the distance enough <laughs> would demonstrate a certain, certain uh, cross-border interest. Uh, following this, uh, following this uh, approach, uh, in this uh, period, in fact, four, four, other, four other cases were uh, declared uh, inadmissible. So the court uh, refused to answer uh, the question. We also uh, face uh, the dispute uh, well known, uh, which is uh, described as uh, the so-called in-house contracts internal contracts or in-house contracts, directly awarded contracts. 
this, uh, this concept is not new. It's about uh, 20 years old. It was first developed in the TACAL cases, which means that if a contracting authority has a control and other body, which is comparable to the control it exercises on his own services. So it's a almost absolute control. And then this entity is providing services or goods for the parent company or, or the controlling company in 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 eighty percent met non under the new legislation, so the majority of its activity is directed to this controlling authority. It could be considered as an in-house uh, in-house uh, contract. In-house contract means that the directives are not applicable. Uh, this uh, this. Uh, idea of in-house contract uh, which was a development by the court now is codified. It's codified uh, by the new, uh, by the two new directives, uh, the, the new directive of uh, 2014 slash 24 or 2014-25. And in fact we can be proud that uh, the legislator codified more or less uh, the jurisprudence or the case law of the court. Nevertheless, some, some judgments of the court remain relevant uh, even under the new directives. For example, in the case Costa, this is 50 slash 14, uh, the court decided that it is possible to grant uh, direct, uh, to, to, to award direct uh, contract to medical transport services, no, uh, sorry, medical transport services to voluntary associations. Voluntary companies which provide these uh, uh, services uh, basically uh, uh, free of charge or only for the remuneration of its costs. Uh, the other uh, judgment which might be interesting is uh, 553 slash 15 undis. In this uh, case uh, the court uh, tried to clarify what does it mean essential part or under the new regulation, this is now the essential part is 80%. And it uh, said, the court said, that it should be provided for the controlling authority and even those activity which is based on an authority's decision but not for the on, uh, controlling authority should not be taken into account. Next subtitle is the personal situation of tenderers, which is basically deals about the exclusions. Exclusions. The first uh, ish, first case is <coughs> uh, 178 uh, slash uh, 16 Mantovani. This is an Italian case. <clears throat> so uh, the issue is about the rehabilitation. If a company or a employee or a director of the company commits a criminal offense, this uh, company could be excluded. But of course, after some time, it could be rehabilitated. Uh, in this case, uh, yes, uh, this director of the company was condemned for a criminal offense, but uh, first of all, it was just uh, one year uh, before uh, the publication of the tender notice, 
and uh, the court uh, considered this is not sufficient. On the other hand, uh, we recognized that the national legislation <coughs> can ask for what is called a full dissociation. So the company must show evidence that it has dissociated itself from the activity of this person, of this criminal offense. And in this case, the fact, the fact that uh, this condemnation was not uh, communicated to the tendering authority was considered as not uh, fulfilling the criteria of a full uh, and effective uh, dissociation. I would mention that this so-called rehabilitation issue is now regulated by the new directive. It, it is in the directive 2014-24 uh, in article 27. Uh, as ask, uh, considering uh, uh, the basic uh, principles uh, in this field, uh, this, is, uh, this is always uh, non-discrimination, equality, and proportionality. Proportionality is extremely important. The case connection taxi services 171.15 was examined whether a member state, a member state as such, by legislative ways, can require that the tendering authority, even if all the conditions are fulfilled to exclude a, a tenderer, should uh, examine once again whether this exclusion would be proportional or not. And the court decided that this is possible. This is possible. The union law does not uh, prohibit uh, such uh, uh, a repeated examine of the proportionality. Uh, this is why, of course, the proportionality and equal treatment, there is another important element which the court takes into account always, which is the large participation. So you have to, to assure, as long as it is reasonably possible, that the participation should be large. Okay, this was also an element of uh, the, in the case, Höygaard Züblin, Züblin, that was, I think it's a Danish case, uh, 396.14, uh, uh, which was uh, relatively simple. It was a group of two, uh, two undertaking, but this group was dissolved, and the question arose whether one tenderer could continue the procedure and uh, at the end can, can achieve, can get uh, the award. And the court uh, uh, responded that yes, it is possible, of course, on the condition that this company initially, initially, so at the beginning of the procedure, meets the requirement laid down by the contracting authority, and the continuation of the participation in the procedure does not create a disadvantage, a competitive disadvantage for the uh, other uh, uh, companies taking part in the tendering uh, procedure. Of course, this, this second condition is more sensitive and difficult it, it needs always a verification by uh, the national judge. <coughs> I don't know, uh, okay. So, um, 
there are uh, many uh, judgments about uh, the subcontracting, so the economic and financial standing. I'm not going into the detail, but basically here uh, the court has a very nuanced, uh, nuanced uh, uh, case law, meaning on the par one part that the court stood for an unlimited uh, subcontracting uh, possibility. On the other hand, I recognize that later the court uh, established that some limits still might be uh, necessary. That was the case in Ostas, uh, the Wroclaw, it's a Polish, and Apelski Darius, this is also a Polish case, and so on. Then, then I do not uh, want into the details of these uh, cases. The transparency. The transparency is also a very important element of the public uh, procurement procedure. Uh, in the case Di Marso, this was 6 uh, slash 15, the question was uh, to what extent uh, the, 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 the evaluation should be, the, the evaluation method should be communicated in advance to the tendering uh, companies. Uh, here the court emphasized that uh, uh, whenever there is a criterion or criteria of evaluation, that necessarily must be communicated. If there is a weighting, that must be communicated. The weighting means that first criteria is 50 percent, the second is 20 percent, the third is 30 percent, and so on and so on. But the method, the method of evaluation should not be communicated. There is no obligation to communicate the method of uh, evaluation. What method means? Well, we have, we have to see in the future. But for example, I would say that if there is C3 evaluators and they decide that they will discuss the evaluation and then somebody would say that this is 20% the weighting, let's give, I don't know, 18% and the two others agree, this is a method. The other method is that the three, each of them, almost confidentiality, would write on a piece of paper a number and then those numbers are revealed and the average is calculated. So this, this is method of calculation and should not be in advance uh, communicated because some freedom of evaluation must be given to the evaluating uh, committee. Application of the national preference. Well, uh, of course, practically every procurement procedure is aiming at avoiding national preference. It is rare that a national preference is given uh, specifically in, in a case. That was uh, in the case of 296.15, Medizanus, who it was that uh, a medicinal product was derived from plasma that was obtained in a specific member state. In a specific member state. Here the court find, although there, there, there could have been some reasons for health reason, for justification, but it was not accepted. It was contrary uh, to, the, to the prohibition of the national uh, preferences. Review procedures. For lawyers, this is the most important, in fact. In the case of PFE, uh, that was a grand chamber uh, case, uh, uh, basically uh, we uh, were evaluating the Italian legislation in which uh, if there is a claim 
for the exclusion of a participant and then the other participant or another participant has a counterclaim against the first person how to handle this situation. The Italian legislation gave a preference to the second, the, to the counterclaim. It said should be examined first the counterclaim and if it is successful the first claim is inadmissible. Basically uh, the court found that this is not in conformity with the directive, not in conformity with the principles of effectivity because the review procedure must be always effective. That was already a principle laid down in the so-called fast web case, it was 100 slash 12, but in the PFE case it was enlarged, meaning that it should not be only when two uh, companies are opposing, it doesn't matter how many, but every company, uh, the, the, the number of uh, company doesn't matter, it, it should be examined whether at the end of the procedure, directly or indirectly, there is a chance to obtain uh, the, 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 the marché, the, how to say marché, the, the, the contract, the, uh, the contract. And of course, if it is, can be reached uh, within, within the, this procedure, certainly the other or the others are excluded and I remain alone, I can get the contract. But if everybody is excluded, indirectly I can get the contract because there will be a new tendering uh, procedure. On the other hand, uh, in, in the case of Bietergemeinschaft, uh, this was 355-15, the court uh, decided that once the exclusion, the decision on the exclusion of a tender is definitive, so it's excluded and all the legal remedies are exhausted and definitive, this company could not challenge the participation of an other tenderer. Interestingly, uh, some, some lawyers raised the question whether the court fees uh, is it, it's an impediment to the, to the effectiveness of the uh, rigor uh, procedures. Uh, that was uh, basically in the case of Horizonte Salute, uh, 6114, uh, and also in the case of Tita, where the court was not impressed by this uh, argument and basically uh, decided that, that the, the, the court fees uh, are not uh, against uh, uh, the effectiveness of the remedy procedures, of course, uh, on the condition that the, 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 the principle of equivalence is, uh, is more or less uh, uh, respected. In the case of uh, Marine uh, Mediterraneo, uh, also the effectiveness of the remedy procedure. Under the Italian law, uh, <clears throat> some decision of the contracting authority could not be subject of an independent judicial review, only a judicial uh, review together with the final decision about the uh, award of the, of the contract or if it made impossible for the tenderer to continue the procurement procedure or caused irreparable, irreparable harm. Well, in that case, uh, the court also decided this is, this is not in conformity with the effectiveness of the remedy procedure. Uh, 
such 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 a decision, even if it is a preparatory, it could be considered a preparatory preparatory act, um, should have an independent and autonomous uh, judicial uh, review. At the end, uh, non-contractual liability of the European Union claim for damages. This was, of course, the subject of the next presentation, if I understand. It's a very good leader, though. Uh, hmm? It's a very good connection. Yes, 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 yes. OK. Well, uh, in fact, uh, there we had one case in this, uh, in this period where, uh, where where a company uh, claimed uh, compensation, and uh, uh, the general court uh, decided that yes, yes, it is entitled to do to, to have this this uh, this uh, uh, compensation. The court was not so not so lenient or not so friendly. Uh, we decided there was uh, no actual damage uh, and no causal link, so we have, uh, in this regard, uh, annulled the decision of the uh, general court. What is the consequence, or well, what can we learn from this affair? Well, this is only one, one case, uh, not much, but it is, seems that the court is a little bit stricter and, uh, and, 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 and examining more convincing reasons uh, to the entitlement of, 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 of damages. Okay, uh, at the end, if, is there any general lesson from, from those cases? Well, uh, this might be a disappointment, but I would say not really, not really. Personally, I think it was business as usual. We had to decide what we had to decide, and deciding we developed a little bit uh, of, the, of the case law. On the other hand, my personal observation is that uh, National courts do not always understand the, the function of the Court of Justice. The, the function of the Court of Justice is not to resolve individual cases, but to give uh, abstract criteria or abstract rules, rules under which an individual, individual case would be decided. And uh, we experience situations where the national court uh, gives us a very, very long story with, uh, with, with all the facts, with all the facts, uh, describing it in very great detail, what, what happened in a case, and then ask whether this is okay or not. Uh, well, uh, in fact, this is difficult, this is not the role uh, of the court because uh, we feel that uh, under those facts the national court should have decided the issue. Uh, by the way, I have to emphasize that uh, there are terms, concepts, words, which call for application and not for interpretation. There is no sense to attach an abstract term to another abstract term, which in itself is understandable and applicable. Because this uh, multiplying the abstract uh, terms, multiplying the abstract uh, concepts would not really advance uh, uh, these things. At the end, uh, personally, I still feel that the number of requests uh, for preliminary ruling will, will increase. Uh, as I indicated, there are three, three new directives, and those details are even more detailed. They are very large. 
very, very large. And we should also add uh, this new regulation, which is also provides for a new kind of, of selection uh, process. So there are new concepts, new terms, new rules, and they obviously would, real, would, read, would, would lead to more need for interpretation. Thank you very much.